Hello everyone, welcome back to Altium Academy. I am your host, Zach Peterson, and today we're going to be looking at a viewer question all about strip line routing. How close is too close for your strip lines? And what happens when you set the wrong layer assignment for your reference plane in your PCB stack up? Now, one of our viewers sent me this question on LinkedIn. And of course, I love getting your comments and questions. We'll take a look at this design in the layer stack manager in Altium Designer, and we'll even do a little bit of simulation in Symbior. Let's go ahead and get started. So let's go ahead and take a look at that viewer question. Zachariah Odaima writes, Hello, Mr. Zach. I have some questions about EMC in my RK3399 design. And then he sends me a picture of the layer stack. So as you can see, this is a 10 layer stack up. I can see here it looks like he's using a lot of the layer thicknesses with the default values for the prepregs when they get added into the stack up. That's kind of a secondary issue here, but let's go with this stack up here. He then also sends some images of his layers. So here on layer four, we have some images with power routing. Now you can see here in layer four, he has circled the power routing as you can see here. And then he asks, is there an EMC issue in this routing? He shows an image of one of his layers and you can see here that we have high speed circled for some of these traces. So he's basically taken a lot of these traces on an internal layer and they look like they're routed pretty close together. And if I just zoom in here, you can kind of make out the spacing between the traces. It looks like it's about double the width of the traces. And so he's asking if all of this is going to be bad from an EMC perspective. Now, if we just scroll back up to one of his earlier messages where he sent me the stack up, he says power two or layer four is being used as the reference layer for the routing on layer five. And then if we look at this stack up drawing, we can see that layer six is a ground plane. So he's basically routing strip lines and he set his ground plane as layer six and then he set the other reference for the strip lines as layer four. However, if we go back in here to the image of layer four, you can see that there is actually no ground on layer four. All he has is this power routing or these power traces. And then he has some other high speed traces that look to be part of a DDR or an SD RAM interface. So the question is, is this bad for EMC? Well, really you have to break this into two parts of the question. And it's not really an EMC issue, it's more of a signal integrity issue. Here, because you have these traces buried inside of the stack up, and because it looks like these are all single-ended traces, you're probably not going to have an EMC issue due to radiation from reflections. However, there will still be some reflections. It's just a question of how much impedance deviation do you have on those strip lines due to the incorrect assignment of a reference layer when calculating the impedance. Now, this is a question that we can answer inside of Altium Designer, and we can use the layer stack manager to do this. We can also do some verification simulations inside of Symbior to see what the effect of skin effect is and on these interconnects. And then using those two pieces of information, we can then predict what the approximate return loss difference is going to be between assigning the correct layer for ground and then what he did was assigning the incorrect layer for ground. So let's go ahead and jump into Altium Designer and Symbior, and we'll take a look at both of these strip line situations, and we'll be able to see really what the difference is when you have an incorrect reference layer assignment in your stack up. Now I'm inside of Altium Designer and I'm inside the layer stack manager and you can see here that I've created a dummy stack up that basically matches the layer arrangement of the layers that are relevant in the viewer question. Now you can see here that I've set my third layer as my signal layer and then the other two layers above it are our choice of reference layers. So again, this question concerns what happens when we set layer two as the reference layer or layer one as the reference layer. Now layer four is also a reference layer. Of course, there are no other options here because again, in the viewer question, he also used this below layer, the reference layer. Now here, if we go to the impedance tab, we can create a single ended transmission line. And then you can see here on the setting in the internal layer that we can switch between the top layer and layer two. So here, if we select layer two as our top reference layer, we have a width of 3.596 mils. 
Now, if we were to switch this to layer one, we would then have our reference plane farther away from the signal layer. So in this case, it's basically assuming that if we set the top reference as layer one, then there is not going to be any copper on layer two that can be used as a reference plane. So if we do this, we would expect the impedance to go up and then the trace would need to be wider in order to hit the 50 ohm target. And so when we do this, you can see that the impedance calculator basically calculates this for us. And it has a width value of 5.083 mils. So that's about a 1.5 mil difference or almost a 50% difference in the calculated width. Now, just as an experiment, what if I were to take this width value from the case where we use layer two as the reference and then plug that back into my width value with layer one as a reference? What would the impedance of that strip line actually be? Well, in that case, when I do this and I paste that value in here, you can see that the impedance comes out to 56.95, so greater than a 10% difference. That's a pretty big difference. In fact, that difference is so large that it is outside of the spec for most high-speed interfaces. So you would wanna do something to bring down that impedance, which is then, again, why you would want to restore the impedance closer to 50 ohms by widening the trace. Now, this is only looking at the lossless impedance for a single-ended transmission line. Now, a good question here is what would happen if we had a differential line? Well, if I add in a differential transmission line, and let's say we have a target impedance of 100 ohms, then the value that we would have for our width really is also going to depend on the spacing. So it's a little bit difficult to make some generalized statements here. But typically, if we were to take this value for the width, and we were to then set the reference layer to layer one instead of layer two and plug this width back in, we might expect actually a smaller deviation in the impedance. And that's exactly what we see. You can see here that we went from 100 ohms to here on screen, we have 103.71 ohms. So only a 3.71% difference. That's definitely within the spec of most high speed interfaces. Now, of course, whether or not you maintain that for all different transmission line designs actually depends on the trace gap. So the trace gap is another important parameter that determines differential impedance. And I've discussed this in a lot of videos. And if you wanna learn more about this parameter, go ahead and check out one of the video links in the description. So clearly there's a difference in the calculated impedance if you select the wrong reference plane in your stack up calculator, or if you set a reference plane, for example, to layer two, but you don't actually put any copper on that reference plane. The magnitude of that error depends on whether we're talking about a single ended transmission line or a differential line. And it also depends on the layer thicknesses involved for the dielectrics in this stack up. So obviously there is a difference, but what happens now when we add in the losses. So to examine that case, we need to go ahead and jump into Symbior. So here I'm inside of Symbior. You can see that I've recreated the stack up inside Symbior to match the settings that I had in Altium Designer. And now I'm going to create a new transmission line. And when I create this new transmission line, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set my top reference layer, as you can see here, to plane one, which is my internal plane layer. And then we're gonna set our bottom reference layer to the bottom side of this dummy stack up. And then you can see here where we have our signal layer. You can see here what gets calculated for the strip width for our 50 ohm impedance, 3.579 mil. And as you can see here in Altium Designer, it's actually alarmingly similar to what Altium Designer calculates because of course, Symbior does run inside the layer stack manager in Altium Designer. So when we go through and click through all this, we're then going to create a new simulation for this circuit. Now, as I click through here, we're just gonna use some of the default settings so we can get the results for this simulation and display them on a graph. Now, when I run this simulation, you can see here what it's calculating. It is calculating the impedance and it's calculating the impedance, including the losses on this interconnect at these various frequencies. Now you can see here the frequency range spans pretty high. It's all the way up to like 76 gigahertz. Of course, you're not gonna need that for most applications. But what's important here is that we can extract an average value in this region at the lower frequency end, and then use that to determine what the S parameters are gonna be at these frequencies. As you can see here, we get an approximate 52.5 ohms average in this region up to about, let's say 10 or 12 gigahertz. Now, if we calculate the return loss on this interconnect, we would basically have a value 
of what looks like about negative 32 dBs of return loss. So that's pretty good. Negative 32 dB of return loss is nothing to complain about, and that's assuming a 50 ohm reference at the load end of this interconnect. Now let's keep that number in mind for just a moment and compare it to what happens in the case where we have the very top layer here in this dummy stack up being used as the reference layer. What I can do is then again, go through and create a new transmission line. And what we wanna do in this case is select the very top plane as our plane layer. Now you can see here, again, it calculates a wider trace uh, width that would be needed to hit this 50 ohm impedance. But what we're gonna do again, is we're gonna put this value for our smaller trace width into this value here inside of Symbior. So we would be putting a value of 3.596 mils into the settings here inside Symbior. And then you can see here again, it calculates a 57 ohm impedance approximately. So again, this is all consistent with what happens inside of Altium Designer. Now, once we create a new simulation and we go ahead and run this and put it into a new graph, you can see here what our average approximate impedance is within that same frequency range, including the losses on this interconnect. And we get to about, I would say, 58.75 ohms. Now remember, in the previous case, our predicted return loss was basically negative 32 dB. In this case, we would have an expected return loss of about negative 22 dB. So about a 10 dB return loss difference. So that's a lot of return loss difference. Now you can see here that it's negative 22 dB, which is below the negative 10 or negative 15 dB return loss threshold that you usually use to reject an interconnect design, but it's a 10 dB difference. So that can be a lot of reflection. Now, if you're doing something like a high speed digital design, maybe it doesn't require these large channel bandwidths and you select the wrong reference layer or you forget to pour some copper, you'll see that maybe you get a negative 10 dB difference, but that 10 dB difference might not matter for your design, especially when it's running at lower speeds. But what if you're dealing with an RF design? Well, in an RF design, that 10 dB return loss difference can be pretty sizable, and it can really impact your total loss budget that you're allowed to have on your interconnect. So this should illustrate why you need to select the correct reference layer, and you can't just assume that the pore gets added automatically. If you're using a signal layer in your PCB stack up to define a reference layer, you have to actually go back in and manually draw out the ground pour to then use as the reference in that layer. If you don't, it's going to be a totally different layer that gets selected as the reference and your impedance might not have the right value. Now, the loss that's created from that impedance could be enough to create sizable effects in your design, especially if it's something like an RF design. Now there's one other thing that we didn't look at in this question, and that is, of course, the crosstalk. Now, as you can see here in this image of the high-speed links, they are pretty close together. Now, if you've watched any of our other videos on high-speed design, you will know that the presence of ground closer to these interconnects is going to provide more shielding between them. It's basically going to suppress the crosstalk between these traces. So again, if you choose the wrong layer or you forget to pour the ground pour in the correct layer, you will then expect greater crosstalk in a situation like this where you're routing your traces closer together. Thanks for watching this video, everybody. There is one way to get around some of these issues that I brought up in this design example, and that is to use plane layers. I personally like signal layers, but of course you could always use a plane layer in the desired reference layer, and that is always going to ensure that you have copper in the region where you want it. Thanks again for watching, everybody. Make sure to hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, leave your comments and questions in the comments section, and last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks. We'll see you next time.